Welcome back, marriage and kinship students. Today we're going to be talking about Gail Rubin's The Traffic in Women, which is a delightful response to Levi Strauss's ideas about kinship, as well as Freud's ideas about the development of gender roles. However, since we haven't read Freud, today in my discussion I'll mostly be focusing on how she responds to Claude Levi Strauss. So, if you remember, According to Levi-Strauss, the incest prohibition is really important because it's the point where nature turns into culture. And that means that it's not important which relationships are prohibited. It's the fact that some relationships are prohibited and it's a universal rule. Incest prohibitions then lead to exogamy, specifically marriage outside the family group. And therefore, for Levi-Strauss, the foundation of kinship is the alliances between families created by exogamous marriage. Marriage is also conceptualized as a kind of gift exchange in which women are the ultimate but not the only gift exchanged between families. But why should we talk of trading women? Assuming for the moment like Levi-Strauss, that we are dealing with heterosexual pairings, doesn't it make equal sense to talk about trading men? And depending on descent and residence rules, it just might. So quickly, some definitions. Unilineal descent is when children belong mostly to one side or the other side of the family. There are obviously two kinds. There's patrilineal descent, where a child that is born and belongs to the same lineage or clan or family group as their father and father's father and father's father's father, etc. There is also matrilineal descent where when somebody is born, they belong to the same lineage or clan as their mother and mother's mother and mother's mother's mother and so on. There is also ambilineal descent where children are considered to have equal ties to both parents' families. Descent rules often correlate with rules about where new married couples should live. Patrilineal societies also tend to be what we call patrilocal. Another term you might see is virilocal. Women move to live with their husband's families upon marriage, and their children grow up with their father's descent group. Matrilineal societies also tend to be matrilocal, or another term you might see is uxorilocal. Men move to live with their wives' families upon marriage, and their children grow up with their mother's descent group. In both cases, this makes sense because you have children growing up with the descent group that they're also part of, and away from their other relatives on the other side of the family who are part of a different descent group. Societies that have Ambilineal descent are often neolocal, which means that married couples form a new household after marriage. Children live with their parents as a nuclear family, and they visit kin on both sides of the family because you're attached to both sides of the family, right? A nuclear family, when we use this term, we specifically mean a married couple and their children. Its opposite is extended family, uncles, aunts, cousins, grandparents, etc. Anybody outside of that direct line of descent or outside of the two generations that are included in a nuclear family. So people um, above the parent generation, below the child generation, and your relatives who are off to the side, your uncles, aunts, cousins, etc. Surely, though, in these various scenarios, it is not only women who are being exchanged in the sense of being moved around from place to place. So why on earth should we speak of women as gifts or of the need to distribute them economically according to the rational desires of men as opposed to their irrational hoarding desires. The answer lies in what Rubin calls the sex gender system. Again, we're talking about this issue of nature versus culture. Humans have lots of biological needs, but the way we satisfy these needs 
is often culturally determined. So we have, generally speaking, a biological need to have sex and to procreate, but the way we satisfy these needs is culturally shaped by our sex gender systems. You can also think of eating and sleeping as examples that might help you understand this. So let's look at food. Consider the existence of systems like halal or kosher. Even people who don't follow um, halal or kosher eating still probably have a conception of animals that you can or can't eat. Um, anybody eating cats out there? Probably you don't think you can eat cats, right? But that's not universally true. There are practices for cooking versus eating things raw. I don't know how many of you like raw things. I can tell you um, as a child in the 90s when sushi first became popular, there were so many people who were grossed out by the idea of raw fish. So grossed out because, oh my God, why would you eat that? How could you eat that? Isn't that dangerous? Isn't that gross? And now sushi is totally normal. In part because even a lot of raw food has still been shaped by human intervention. It has been foraged, chopped, arranged nicely on plates. I'm a big fan of those raw food date and nut bars. And there is very little that's actually like raw or natural about those. Um, they're delicious, but, <laughs> you know, I think raw is maybe not quite the right word. So with this in mind, let us think explicitly about the sex gender system. Rubin suggests that we can ask a similar question. We can ask what counts as food? What are the appropriate ways to eat? We can also ask what counts as sex? Who are you allowed to have sex with and who not? What activities count as sex and what don't? And she sort of summarizes the sex gender system very briefly by describing it as a set of arrangements by which the biological or raw material of human sex and procreation is shaped by human social intervention and satisfied in a conventional manner, no matter how bizarre some of the conventions may be or may seem to us. And Rubin argues that kinship systems are one of the major engines for organizing all of this. So we speak of the traffic in women, not because it's women that are being moved around factually, but because of the patriarchal sex gender system that we ourselves are embedded in. Women are oppressed specifically through exchange because I'm not going to read this whole quote. It's really long. You can pause the video and read it yourself. The exchange creates relationships between men. The exchange is between the men who transfer the woman. And the exchange is what creates social relationships. So to talk about exchanging women is to discuss men as being full social actors who participate in social relationships with each other and women as non-agentive people who don't have power and who don't get any of the benefits of being part of a society. In, in a way, they're not part of society. The traffic in women is also uniquely about women. Ruben notes that men can be trafficked too, but usually only after some catastrophe has happened to them and they've been enslaved. By contrast, all women can be trafficked and only because they are women, not because of any particular characteristic or because of any particular status. Simply being a woman in and of itself is a catastrophic social status. So Rubin concludes that in this sense, the exchange of women is a profound perception of a system in which women do not have full rights to themselves. So let's talk about the gender part of the sex gender system. The traffic in women is the foundation upon which marriage conceived of as basically heterosexual rests. 
But before we can have this traffic in women, we have to have the division of people into different genders. Rubin defines gender as a socially imposed division of the sexes. This division is enforced and performed by basically everyone all the time by behaving in ways that are appropriate to their assigned gender category. Okay, moving on, let's look at the sex part of the sex gender system. We have incest prohibitions and rules of exogamy that determine who you should direct your sexy feelings at. You can't feel sexy feelings for just anyone. You are supposed to feel them for a delimited group of people. This is both in a traditional sense much more specific and much more complicated than the current terms heterosexual or homosexual. It's not just that you are supposed to desire somebody of the opposite gender, but rather in some cases where, for example, you're supposed to marry your cousin, you're not supposed to be heterosexual, you're supposed to be cousin sexual. Female sexuality is typically constrained. Ideally, women are docile enough or malleable enough to be aimed at their promised partners, men's less so. And it's also important to notice that women, men, wife and husband are socially determined categories and roles, and biology does not strictly determine who it inhabits them. So for example, you have phenomena like newer women marriage, where a man who has no male heirs can just designate one of his daughters as a son, and then she, as a son, is able to take a wife, and they probably enlist some help in conceiving a child, but then that child is hers, and she's the father of the child, and her wife is the mother. This is the thing that happens. Um, there are also, in lots of different societies, historical and contemporary transgender and third gender roles. So biology and gender are not the same thing. And heterosexuality for Rubin is about the structural role you occupy, not about your actual body. So newer women marriage is something that Rubin would consider heterosexual. The structure of the system insists on a unit of opposites. So heterosexuality is compulsory, even if it's not heterosexuality as you might be thinking about it. So what then is the role of kinship systems in shaping the sex gender system? They create gender divisions by determining who can be married to whom. They establish heterosexual social relationships, that is marriage. They establish homosocial relationships of alliance between men who were not related previously. They determine the universe of appropriate sexual partners and sexual satisfaction for humans. And they delineate the responsibilities, obligations, and rights that are part and parcel of kin relationships. So one question, this is awful. Why do we perpetuate it? How do we become the kind of people who adapt to the demands of kinship systems? How do we internalize the idea that all of this is normal and that men get to be real participants in society and women don't? Rubin suggests that we can look to psychoanalysis for an account of individual development. And here's where she talks about Freud. But she notes that just as social forms of labor demand certain kinds of personality who can time their work according to a clock, the social forms of sex and gender demand certain kinds of people. So the question I want to leave you with is, how might we imagine something different? According to Rubin, is a different kind of sex gender system possible? What do you think? The sex gender system will always be a cultural product and there will probably always be a sex gender system of some kind. But is there any reason it can't be a more equitable one? And are things possibly already changing? Thank you so much for your attention and I will see you virtually next time.